think a mic is working. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. In the back? No. need to talk to Check, 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 check. Yeah. Oh, the mic is not on. Let's turn it down. There we go. All right. So this is a little bit of a treat for me because most of the time I get to talk to biologists and clinicians, and it's very rare for me to talk to an audience of you know computer science and machine learning scientists. So this is really exciting. My name is Artem. I'm a postdoc in Josh Stewart's lab at UCSC. Uh, machine learning is very much my first love. I took uh, my, my very first class, my first year of grad school, and ever since then I've been hooked. I kind of jumped around applications a little bit and then settled on bioinformatics, and this is what I've been doing for the past seven years or so. So today I'm going to talk to you a lot, kind of a lot about how to integrate biological knowledge into machine learning problems. And what I'd like to do is just start out with biology overview, because maybe it's been a few years, maybe a few decades since we've had a biology class, and because we're going to be talking about biology, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to acknowledge the, the, the following kind of schematic has been made by a grad student in our, in our lab, Chris Zito, who recently graduated. But what he's done here is he depicted a cell, right? So we have a cell membrane. Here's the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the DNA, so this is a a molecule, double-stranded molecule. And what I've done here is I've highlighted a region of the DNA that, that codes for a protein. It's something that we call a gene. Now, before a protein is made, this DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which you can think of it as if DNA was a blueprint, this is a copy of a blueprint, a one-stranded copy of a blueprint. And then this RNA gets translated into a protein, and then proteins are the basic building blocks of everything that happens in a biological organism, right? And then, in this particular example, say that this protein sits inside the membrane of the cell, and what it's doing is it's, it's, it's trying to sense for the growth factors that are out there, outside of the cell. And when it senses a growth factor, what it does is it passes the signal to the rest of the cell, and it says, well, it's time to grow, to proliferate, to divide. And this is, you know, this is just basic central dogma of, of biology. Now, things don't always go as well as you hope, and sometimes when a cell divides and the DNA is copied, replicated, there's an error. There's some sort of mutation that happens. And cancer is a very heterogeneous disease, so there's lots of things that could go wrong. But suppose for a second that what this mutation does is it amplifies this gene. What it means is that now, rather than having just a single copy, a single copy of the blueprint, we have three copies. Because we have three copies, we now made three proteins. Each one of those proteins performs exactly the same function. It sits inside of this membrane, it senses for the signal, but now because there are three of these proteins, the signal is amplified three times, and now the cell goes out of control. It starts growing and dividing uh, much more rapidly. Some of the other things that can happen in cancer, I don't have a slide for this, but what could happen is rather than have multiple copies of the RNA blueprint, sometimes you have multiple copies of the same gene, and they will just kind of sit next to each other on the DNA, right? So you can think of how that's going to be a problem. If you have multiple copies in the blueprint, then when you create copies of the copies, you also have multiple RNA and then multiple proteins. Another thing that can go wrong in cancer is that sometimes these proteins become activated even if there is no growth, growth signal. So the cell is all happy, the organism doesn't tell it to grow, and all of a sudden this protein decides, oh, I think I'm sensing a growth signal, but no, there isn't one, and I'm going to go ahead and signal. The reason I'm telling you all this is that cancer is a very heterogeneous disease which means that lots of different things can go wrong, and there is no one simple solution to this. Now, we're going to swap a little bit and talk about the computational side. And the challenge is the following, is that when, when I'm putting together an experiment, or when biologists create an experiment, typically the number of features that they collect is vastly higher than the number of samples. And what I'm doing here is that I'm, I'm showing you an example from uh, one of the projects that we're working on, the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a multi-institutional collaboration that tries to map out the cancer genome. And typically, the way they do it is they focus on one tissue at a time. So we can, for example, think about breast cancer. In the, in the case of breast cancer, they have 800-some samples. And for every sample, they've collected information at the DNA level. So C and V stands for copy number variation, how many copies of each gene there is in the, at the DNA level. Expression is how many copies you have at the RNA level. So the higher the expression, the more RNA you have. 
And then you can also have some protein activity information. So for any given sample, and there are 20,000 20, genes in the genome, you have 20,000 values for the, at the DNA level, 20,000 values at the RNA level, you know, 20,000 values at the protein level. There's some additional information. So you have tens of thousands of features, but only 800 samples in the best case. And even recently, when people start analyzing cancer across multiple tissues, if we put all of that together, the highest data set, or the largest data set in this particular project has only 5,000 samples. So again, it's, it's the difference between number of features and number of samples is insane. Now, why is that a problem, right? So uh, hopefully I don't need to, you know, this, everybody should feel at home here with machine learning, but stop and ask me questions if, if, you, have, uh, if you have them as I go. Uh, a lot of work that I do is at the RNA level. So what I'm going to talk about is gene expression. This is how you can think of this: how many copies of my blueprint I have at the RNA level, and you can think of each number as a dimension. Right? So I, here is, I'm plotting the expression of, of two genes. You can think of it that I might have a problem as these are my patients that the cancer patients that react to a particular drug. These are my cancer patients that don't react to to the same drug. A new patient comes in. And I want to know whether or not they're going to react to a drug before I give them that drug. So it's a, a very simple binary classification problem. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about linear methods, and I'm going to tell you why linear methods is all we need. But a, li a linear method is defined by a weight vector w, which kind of you can think of as it defines a separating hyperplane here, and then this bias term, which you can think of as the offset either in the positive direction or in the negative direction. So after we train a classifier and we build the linear model, when a new sample comes in, we simply see which side of the hyperplane it lands on, and this is how we make the prediction. Now, here's a small example. So regardless of how you label these points, I'm making a claim that I'm able to build a linear predictor that separates the positives from the negatives. And if you don't believe me, this is the case, right? So there are three possible labelings. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of skipping over the case where all three points are the same label. So regardless of how I label these three points, I'm able to separate them linearly. Now I'm going to jump up to four points. Here's a case where I can't no longer do that, and I would actually have to go to three dimensions to be able to separate that. Now this example is arises from what's known as uh, Vapnik Chernovensky's dimension theory. And what it says is that a set of n points can be linearly separated for all possible labelings in n plus n minus 1 dimensions. Now, if you remember back uh, about the cancer genome atlas example that I was talking about, we have 50,000 or more features, less than 1,000 samples. Regardless of how you label the samples, I'm always going to be able to separate them in real. This is why one of the reasons why nonlinear predictors are not necessary in systems biology. Another reason is it's not always enough to ha simply have an accurate classifier. We do a lot of collaboration with biologists and clinicians, and when we build a predictor and they make some sort of predictions, they want to know why. They want to know which features are important in making that prediction. And as soon as you start moving away from a linear space to a nonlinear space, you have to be able to explain how those things interact in a nonlinear way. So this is another reason why we stick with linear predictors. So what I've told you so far is that regardless of the labelings of the points, I'm able to separate them linearly. What that means is that it's always easy to train a classifier that gives you perfect separation on the training data between the positives and the negatives. Well, how well does it generalize? And there are typically two cases. So let's, let's think about a low sample scenario. So I only have one sample from each class. One, one canonical scenario that happens is that when I build a predictor, it doesn't generalize at all. And typically, when you're trying to predict drug sensitivity, so given a cell and a drug, whether or not that's the, the, the growth of that cell is going to be inhibited when, it's, when the drug is administered or not, that's the primary problem. And it's, uh, it almost always tends to be a very hard problem where the predictor that you build on the training data does not generalize on, on the new data. Now, the other case is what I call the easy case, which is there's really good generalization because they're, the classes are so well separated in this multi-dimensional space that you can really slice the space in many different ways and still get perfect separation, including on the new test data. Right? And what I'm doing here is I'm giving you an example. Well, maybe I build some sort of a, a linear predictor that, that kind of looks robust. Maybe this is a support vector machine that, that has the largest distance from the class as the positive or the negative. But you know, I could also just consider a predictor in a single 
with a single gene. I can only look at the expression of gene one and be able to make a prediction, and it would give me a perfect classifier. I can also do the same thing with just gene two, go and go, you know, look at the single gene and be able to make a prediction. It's going to be perfectly accurate. Now, this is a problem because when you get to interpretation, when you go to a biologist and you tell them, hey, these are the genes that I think implica are implicated in this particular process, they're going to ask you why, and you don't really have a good story because the, the, the problem is so easy that you're able to get, you know, just by grabbing random genes, you're able to build a perfect predictor that will separate A versus B. And what I'm, what I'm saying here is that this is typically trying to, so when you try to predict what type of cancer you have, right? So a, a new patient comes into the clinic, you sequence their DNA or RNA, you build it, you apply your predictor, and you say, it looks like you have a specific type of breast cancer or, or you know, a different type of breast cancer. Now, a pathologist can look at the sample under a microscope and tell you whether this is breast cancer type A or type B and so, and so on. So the cells look very different, so of course, the expression of many, many genes are going to be different, which is why it's so easy to, to build a very different. How many different types of cancers? There are five that are characterized pretty well, and the, the way they're characterized is by what type of receptor sits on the surface. There's usually estrogen, uh, progesterone, and uh, HER2. So depending on the combination of which ones are, are are there is is what defines the cancer. For example, there's there's one uh, type of breast cancer that's extremely invasive and deadly called basal breast cancer, and it actually has all three of those off. So it, it's not sensitive to estrogen, it's not sensitive to to HER2 or progesterone. You can think of this a Tesla. You cut off the fuel, right, the, the signaling, and it's still going. All right. So this is uh, just going over what I already said, which is it's not enough to simply have a, uh, an accurate predictor. We'll also be able to, to draw up a biological story. And really, the issue goes back to this fact that we have so few samples and so many features, so many dimensions that we're working with. Well, how do we, how do we get around this problem? One way is to introduce more constraints, is to grab more samples. And I was talking to Irv just a, a, a little bit earlier and he says, I, I don't really understand this problem where you know, we have thousands of samples sequenced out there in the databases. And that's true, however, those samples are not labeled. It's not that somebody performed an experiment where they tested for every single sample that was sequenced whether or not it responds to a particular drug. So yes, the data is out there, but it's unlabeled. So we have to be smart about how we incorporate that data. I'm not going to talk about semi-sequence well learning in this talk, but it's, it's something I'm interested in. The other one is, well, Genes don't work in isolation. It's not that one dimension of your data is completely independent of another dimension. And if you do mach uh, machine vision, computer vision, then you're probably familiar with this idea in that your pixels, like neighboring pixels, are not independent of each other. So this is the same story here, is that genes are working together. And there's typically a network that defines how, how this works. So what I've done here is I kind of mocked up a little network here. Every node here is a gene. If an arrow is, if it's an arrow, then what it means is that this gene has a positive upregulation on the other gene. What that means is that if there are multiple copies of this gene, then what it's going to do is it's going to cause this gene to have multiple copies as well. If there's a lot of RNA, it's going to cause a lot of RNA here. If there's a lot of protein activity, it's going to cause a lot of protein activity here. So basically it says that if this gene is up, as I'm designated here with the red color, then this other gene is going to be up as well where, I mean, up is, is this, you know, more active. Other genes, this, this is typically signified with this little bar, has the opposite effect, which means that it's an inhibitor. If this gene is highly active, then it tries to downregulate or, or silence a, a specific gene. Right? And there is information about how these genes interact based on known biology. So when we have a weight vector, where we have a number for every single gene, whether or not it's positive or negative, we actually want this to be fairly consistent with what we know about biology. Now, if we're just grabbing a random number of genes, or ra random genes building a signature in that, uh, think of, so, sorry, I have to define here. Think of a signature and a weight vector and a classifier as interchangeable terms. So, so a, a gene signature is a predictor that is based on gene expression. 
So that it's just biologists like to talk about uh, signatures. So in this particular case, this solution is not as good. So say this also perfectly separates my positive class from the negative, but it doesn't agree with biology, right? We have a couple of dis disagreements here where it says, well, I'm, I'm saying that gene A is important or it's upregulated, but gene B, which should also be upregulated, is not according to my classifier. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to build predictors where I take into account this additional information about gene-gene interactions, and that's, that's kind of the problem. Now, there are, I, I like to think of kind of building the predictor as a, a little bit of a pipeline. Features come in, you train a predictor, so you can think of it as a training function of some sort, and then this predictor will usually have feature scores, so not sample scores, but feature scores. If we're working with a linear predictor, a linear method, then our feature scores are simply the weights that we got back on, on the linear model. And I have some prior information about biology with the network. I can inject this prior information in several places. I can give it directly to the features in the form of uh, a dimensionality reduction. Maybe I only want to grab features that are in the data that are consistent with my prior biological knowledge. I can also do something similar at the other end. right? So I have a bunch of gene weights from my classifier. I can place them on the network, and then I can look for saturated subnetworks, and that will kind of tell me something about the biology that's going on. The disadvantage in both of these cases is that the predictor never really gets to see the prior biological knowledge. So the intuition is that if a predictor, if we give the prior biological information directly to a predictor, it might be able to build a more robust or a better model directly. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to spend more time talking about this link rather than the other ones, making a note that there is literature out there that has done both, or all three. Now, I would like to motivate a little bit more about why we need prior biological information. You know, I, I gave you one example where we think that you know, you know, it, it will help us introduce more constraints, but I want to demonstrate to you just how powerful prior biological information is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this uh, DREAM challenge. DREAM is a series of competitions that happen every year. They're pretty well known in systems of biology. The goal is usually to infer something about cancer or something about the biology, underlying biology. Our lab participated in last year's, which was Dream 8, and also this year's Dream 9. We won both of those. However, I'm not going to talk about Dream 9 because we're a little bit under embargo right now. Until the publication comes out, we're not allowed to share results. Otherwise, it's going to undermine the publication. So I'm going to talk about last year's uh, revision. So I'm going to go back to this picture where uh, we have a set of proteins that are sitting inside the membrane. They sense some growth factors, and then they signal to the cell to go ahead and grow. And the idea here is that this growth is not necessarily well understood, or I should say it's not completely understood. And so the goal of the challenge is to uncover exactly how the single signaling happens in the cell. There's usually this symbiotic relationship between the biologists and the bioinformaticians, which is, you know, the biologists are interested in uncovering what's going on in the cell, so they do a lot of perturbation experiments. They might feed a particular compound to a cell or give it a drug. Then they're going to measure a lot of what happens to all the other proteins or all the other genes in the, in the cell. Then they give this data over to us, the bioinformatics people. We then tell them, well, we think that the genes are connected in the following way. So for your next experiment, you might want to target a particular hub or a particular gene. We give the, that information, and they go back to the, to the lab, and then they, they hammer that particular gene with, a, with an inhibitor. And the goal of the gene challenge is to do exactly that, is to give them this information about what happened in the cell, is to infer which genes talk to each other, which proteins interact with each other. Now, the data set is a little bit interesting in the sense that we're used to thinking of a data set as a matrix in terms of we have features in the columns, samples in the rows, or vice versa, depending on which application you're working with. Here, you have that. You have features in rows and samples in columns. However, you have this data collected for, for several time points. So what they've done is they've performed some sort of a experiment, biological experiment, and then they measured for 45 proteins what happens at 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and then several hour markers. Now, they've done it in four different cancer cells. They've exposed each of the four cells to different stimuli. Some of them are insulin. Some of the other ones are growth factors. So those are the little boxes that were floating outside of the cell that I, that I said. And they've also hammered different proteins with inhibitors. And you can think of a, a, an inhibitor as 
I'm, I'm completely silencing that protein and preventing it from doing its job. So, they, so what you essentially have is a hypercube of five dimensions, so cell lines by stimuli, by time, by proteins, by, uh, by inhibitors. And the, the question is how do you use all of this data to make inference about which proteins talk to what other proteins? You, might, you probably don't think about protein interaction on your daily basis, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the following analogy. Say that I have a really exciting news, and I'm telling that news to John. John has a collection of friends. I have no idea who his friends are, but he's really excited about this news, and he goes over and he tells that exact same news to all of his friends. Then those friends tell that news to their friends, and so on. Now, the type of measurement that I'm collecting is I'm measuring how excited that every person is in this room, for example. And I'm measuring the excitement at when I first told the news to John, then I'm measuring it at five minutes after I told the news, 15 minutes, and so on. So I have all these measurements for every single person in this room about how excited they are at every time interval. And then my goal is to infer who's friends with whom, basically. <coughs> so that's, that's kind of the problem. And when I was talking about inhibitors, you can think of an inhibitor as me putting a duct tape over somebody's mouth. So I'm completely preventing you from sharing the news with your friends. I'm preventing the protein from doing its job. And this, this is kind of a, a, a little bit of philosophical about what it means that protein A is causal protein B. But the, the way the organizers presented this, say, again, this is the y-axis here is the excitement level of a protein or, or, or a person, in my, in my analogy. And when there is no intervention on A, so I'm measuring the excitement of protein B, when I didn't put a duct tape over the person A's, A's mouth. They were pretty excited. They got, you know, they got really excited when they heard the news, and then they stopped being excited. Now, if I put the tape over person A's mouth, or if I'm inhibiting the protein A, then I'm no longer seeing this jump in excitement for protein B. And what that tells me is that there's, it's, more, it's pretty likely that B is a friend of A, that protein A talks to protein B, because we performed this experiment. And what the organizers are saying is that this really, you know, this connection is dependent both on which cell you're looking at, as well as what are the different stimuli that are floating outside of the cell. So don't make an assumption that just because protein A talks to protein B in one of the cells under one set of conditions, that the same, the same happens in another one. Now, another important aspect of this challenge is that they didn't have probes for all of the proteins that that were that were there. So. What they're saying is that maybe protein A doesn't talk directly to protein B. They have another friend who's not in the room. It's, it's not a friend that we measure. And if we see a level of, you know, some, some evidence that A interacts with C through some other node, then we go ahead and predict this link directly. We tell the organizers this, there's a link between A and C. Even though there, is, there isn't a direct one, it has to go through B. But because they didn't measure B, they have no way of validating that. That's, that's the only reason. If you went indirectly, doesn't that lead you to expect that C would respond more slowly than indirectly? So by looking at time dependence, maybe I can distinguish directness or indirectness, even if I can't, that, that's even true. if I'm not that's wise true. enough to know about B. That, that's very true. But the, the important point here is that they would penalize you for an indirect edge if they also measured, right? So if both A, B, and C were in this room and were able to measure the excitement level of all three people, of all three proteins, then it would be incorrect for me to say that A is friends with C when the news were shared with B and then with C. But yeah, you could potentially look at time and, and, and make that inference. Now this is going to be, this is actually going to be important. So Josh Stewart, the, the head of my lab, has an army of graduate students. And what I've done is I've put together a team with several of those students and we've decided what we're going to do is we're going to take this challenge and run it on a local level. And the, the, the prize was free food, because these guys are grad students, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but our, our intuition was is that uh, there's a paper out there that says that rather than having a single predictor, it's actually better to build multiple predictors and then use them together in an ensemble to make better predictions. This was our intuition. We we're going to compete with each other. And then we're going to take our best performing methods and we're going to combine them and submit the ensemble as the final predictor. So this was our game plan. And as it turned out, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to talk about the work of these two guys.
because this, this is what ended up winning the challenge. But bear in mind that all of these guys deserve credit because you know, this, was, this was very much a collaborative effort. So this is just a showing of the leaderboard where we've actually, uh, so each of these guys made a submission uh, with their specific method and three out of the four top methods were ours. But the, the winning method consisted of two parts. And the first part was this biological prior. Now, I, I kind of make a, a little anecdote here, which is I worked on predicting protein function during my PhD. And we competed in this, this challenge that does exactly that, which is can you predict what the proteins do under, in certain species under certain circumstances. And what struck me interesting about that challenge is that they never, the organizers never gave you training data. They just told you, these are the proteins we're interested in, can you predict what they do? And as I was talking to my PhD advisor, he said this. He said that maybe it's the person that puts together the best training set is the person that's going to win. And it, kinda, it, it blew my mind a little bit because up until that point, I was always used, if there is a prediction competition, the organizers give you this is the training data, this is the test data, and you're supposed to train the model on the training data and then make predictions on the test data. However, if you're allowed to bend the rules, in the sense that you're allowed to bring additional data, time and time again, I've seen that this helps. So if you're doing competitive machine learning, think about what other data you can, you can, you can pull in here. What we've done is we went to one of the databases out there that keeps track of which genes talk to what other genes. In this particular case, this, this one was Haply Commons, which actually combines some of the other databases, so it's more about conglomeration. Now, I lied to you a little bit when I said that signaling is not well understood. It's, there's actually three pathways that everybody studies in cancer, that almost everybody knows about that goes from outside of the cell when it gets the growth signal down to the nucleus of the cell. And the, the first one is, uh, it, it's called PI3 kinase. And then there's another, and this one is actually, it's perturbed or it, there's a lot of mutations in breast cancer that happen, that happen along this pathway. The other one goes through uh, several of genes on this side, uh, ras -RAF. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it, you know, it's, molecular biology that doesn't necessarily pertain to what I'm, I'm trying to say here, but the, the idea here is that here, this is happening at the protein level. This is a protein getting excited, and then it signals to this other protein, which then gets excited, and it signals to this other protein, and so on. And same thing happens on this side. This, this third pathway is a little bit different. Here, when a protein gets activated, rather than signaling to another protein, what it says is, I need more copies of a particular gene. So what it, it does is it signals directly to the transcription machine and it says, can you make me more RNA copies of this particular gene? So it's not a protein talking directly to another protein, it's a protein talking to the, to the molecular machinery that makes proteins. Now, remember when I, when I talked to you about direct and indirect edges? Well, take a note here that EGFR does not directly interact with AKT, it has to go through a PI3 kinase. Well, it just so happens that PI3 kinase is not one of the proteins that was measured. So this is the guy that's not in the room. So somebody here is an EGFR. They have a friend, PI3 kinase, that's outside of this room. They share the news with them, probably with a text. Then the PI3 kinase shared the news with the AKT, and AKT is in this room. So if we just look in this database, there is no direct link. right? It has to go through a PI3 kinase, in this case, a P3CA. So this is the path of the news. But remember that we can't just submit this network because the organizers want an indirect edge. So to get around this, uh, this problem, what we do is we apply heat diffusion. And if you've done a lot of graph analysis, you're probably familiar with, it, with this idea. It comes from physics. The idea is that we apply, if we're interested in how similar or how much of a information flow there is be between two nodes, what we do is we apply simulated heat in one of the nodes we let the heat diffuse over the network, and then we measure the temperature in another node. And then this gives you kind of a similarity function between the two nodes, a proximity or distance, or, or however, however you want to define it. And it's, it's actually pretty simple to compute. You just take the Laplacian of the graph. Uh, gamma here is, you can think of as a resistance. So if we set gamma to infinity, if there is uh, infinite resistance, 
then it's e to the negative infinity, which is zero, so that means nobody gets to talk to anybody else. And if gamma is zero, if there is no resistance, then it's exponent of the zero, which is one, that means everybody is equal. You said Laplacian of a graph. Is that another yeah. graph? It's a matrix. Right? So Laplacian of a graph is a matrix, which can be interpreted as a graph. And then you do a matrix exponentiation. And this gives you back another matrix, which is a node-node matrix that measures uh, exactly the process that I described, which is if I were to apply temperature of node I, or heat of node I, and measure temperature of node J, K I J is going to tell me what the temperature is going to be. So this is exactly what we did, is we took these, these pathways that had at least two of the targets that were in the, that were, that the organizers were interested in, we combined this into a single graph, we applied heat diffusion, and this produced a matrix that told us how much interaction or how much causality there is from protein into protein B. Just by itself, just submitting the prior, scored in the second place. So think about it. The organizers hosted the competition, they collected the data set. Without even looking at the data set, we were able to outperform everybody else. So this tells you how powerful prior biological information is. Now, of course, this wouldn't be a very interesting story if I also didn't tell you that what we did to improve on the prior biological knowledge. But otherwise, it would say, well, the data is completely useless. You just keep submitting exactly what you know. But we're able to improve on that. And what we did to do that is we borrowed this idea from economics. And we spend, as scientists, a lot of time talking about correlation does not imply causation. Well, what this guy did is he challenged that notion. He said, correlation might be evidence of causation. And the way you think about it is, if you have two time series, and this is economics, so you know, in, in his case, this was stock market maybe, or, or, or you know, something of that nature, and you see an unusual event happening in time series A, and the claim that he was making is that if you're able to make a correlation to another event in another time series B that happened at a later time, then that correlation might be evidence that A causes B. It does not imply, right, it's not a logical implication, but this is evidence that there might be A, A, A affects B. The way it has been done traditionally uh, with, with the Granger causality is you build an autoregressive model on B, which is can you predict the values of B from the previous time points of B itself. <coughs> then you build a second model, which is can you predict the values of B from the past values of itself and the past values of A. And then you compare how well does the second model do compared to the first one. And if you see an improvement from the second one, from the first one to the second one, then you say, aha, uh -huh, adding information from A really helps predict B. Therefore, we suspect that there's correlation or evidence that A causes B. So this is how it's been formulated traditionally. You can run into problems here if you have lots of different time series. Because not only do you have to consider all possible pairs, but you also have to consider all possible triplets, all possible quadruplets, all possible groups of, of size k. This grows combinatorially very quickly. So what people have done is they've extended this using a lasso model. And you can think of it as, as this. Now I have four, four time series here. I'm interested in predicting the value at time t for time series y using its previous values as well as the previous values of the other time series. So you can think of it as a window into the past of length L across all the different time series. So this is, this is what defines my error term. I'm also introducing this regularization term. Now you can recognize this as a lasso penalty. What it means is that the higher the lambda, the more values are going to be set be exactly zero. Excuse me, what's lasso? Lasso is this. It's a, it's a, it penalizes the absolute value of the weights, and it has the property that the higher the penalty is, the more weights are going to be exactly zero. They're going to get snapped to be exactly zero. This is very desirable in a model, because anything that's not zero, you can then interpret as important features. And everything that is zero, you say, OK, I don't care about it, because it has no impact on the model. To be consistent with the Granger, what we've done is we've set this lambda to be such that only the weights that are autoregressive are zero, right? So we, we kept increasing that, that value 
higher and higher and higher until we notice, okay, now all of the weights that are associated with the autoregression are zero, and then we look at all the other weights. And if there's something that's not zero, then that, you know, based on the Granger, uh, Granger suggestion that says that, well, there's probably some, some sort of causality that goes on from that time series to the time series that we're trying to predict. Now, this is a paper that's been published already with Lassa Granger. What we've done is we've taken it. Yes? So I, I didn't understand that expression where you're penalizing the absolute value of the weight since there's more than one weight. Uh, sorry, this should be sum, uh, the L1 norm of the, of the weight vector. So it's the sum of the absolute values of the weights. Yeah, yeah I'm a, sorry, I was a little sloppy with notation mostly because when I put up equations, I, so when I talk to biologists and clinicians, I don't use equations. But with you guys, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this talk is I feel like I can use equations, but at the same time, I don't want to make them too complicated because I still want to be able to explain things without proof of happening you can sleep. But. So this is why the notation is a little bit sloppy. But what we've done with that model is we took it and then we extended it so that rather than just looking into the window in the past, we're now considering the entire data matrix, both the past and the present. Right, so this is again, say that we're trying to, it, it's, we again formulate it as a linear regression, where we're trying to predict this as, as our output variable, everything else is an input variable, perform exactly the same computation where we set the penalty so that all of the auto regression, both from the past and the future is exactly zero. Anything else that's not zero is interpreted as causality. We have to be a little bit careful because Th typically, again, this is getting a little bit philosophical, but typically things in the past cause things in the future. So if we have a non-zero <laughs> weight, a non-zero weight from the future, then we actually flip the causality link. Even though this is a regression, you know, regress of the output variable, it's not that the something in the future causes something in the past to happen. It's just there's some correlation, and we have to be careful about the causality. Again, this is the philosophical notion that you subscribe that things happen in a linear time fashion. Okay, and then the final method, the winner of the Dream A challenge was the combination of the prior with what I just described. Both of those generate two matrices. We simply combine them with the arithmetic mean, and this is what ended up winning the challenge. Are there any questions? And also, how am I doing on time? Fun? Okay. So, I, I want to spend a little bit of time. So I've, what I've done so far is hopefully I convinced you how powerful prior biological knowledge is, or knowledge, prior knowledge in general, hopefully, for, for other fields as well. The next question is, how do you incorporate it? Right? And what I want to show you now is something that I've been working on that I'm hoping is general enough for people to use outside of bio biological applications as well. Now, to do that, I have to introduce the concept of regularization, and I kind of brushed it. I, uh, Brushed, uh, uh, brushed up against it a little bit when I was talking about Lasso Granger. But the idea is that a very large portion of machine learning methods can be expressed as a minimization problem when you're training it, as something where you're minimizing the error as well as the complexity of the model. Principal components analysis can be written in this form. Linear regression can be written, written in this form. Support vector machines can be written in this form. A lot of uh, Bayesian uh, probabilistic approaches can be written in this form. There, you can think of it as because you're maximizing the likelihood, you can minimize the negative likelihood and the negative log likelihood, and that becomes your error or your loss term. And then your model complexity is actually acts as a prior in the log space. And then when you when you add the two, this 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 is uh, typical Bayesian stuff. So all that to say is that if we're uh, if we're able to make some, some changes to this methodology, then what we're doing is we're affecting a large number of methods. Now, typically, there's a trade-off when you when you when you're solving this minimization problem between optimizing the loss or the error and optimizing the model complexities. And this is designated as lambda. You can think of it as a slider. I can place more emphasis on making a very accurate model, or I can put more emphasis on making a simpler model. And here's an example. This has nothing to do with biology. This is synthetic data. What I've done is I generated some points, and I'm asking, so my, my input data is x, my output variable is y, can I build a linear model 
that maps x to y. What I've done here is I've used radial basis functions, which is why you see nonlinearity. But because of the nonlinear non basis functions, I'm still able to produce a linear model. Right? So I'm able to produce a model that goes through every single point. You know, I built a perfect classifier on the training day. However, my argument is that this is not a very good model because presumably there's some noise in the data. And when we sample more points, this is not a test data coming in, I am pretty far off from some of those points. And this is because I didn't regularize. I didn't penalize high weights. Once I start introducing the penalty on the weights, I am now reducing the model complexity. In this particular case, you can think of model complexity as how squiggly the line is. The higher the penalty, the flatter the line. When I introduce a little bit of the penalty, I am now removing some of those extra squiggles. And my argument is that this is a better model because it, it now generalizes to new data. Of course, there's typically a sweet spot because you can overdo the regularization. You can put a lot of emphasis on wanting a really simple model. And if you set lambda to infinity, you will just get a degenerate case of a simple baseline, the average value of the response. So typically, there's a sweet spot. Typically, it's uh, found using cross-validation. Or if you have some intuition, such as in the case of, Gla or of Granger, you can set it to directly to a particular value. So regularization is important. When we talk about linear models, we can think of uh, the model complexity as penalizing the weights. So again, this is from a slide that I showed at the very beginning. Right? So my linear model is defined by a set of weights. This defines a hyperplane. B is the basis vector. When I learn it, I, again, remember, I'm, I'm learning to minimize some, some loss function, some error between my predictions, my true values. My lambda is my slider. And then I have some penalty on the W. If you read statistic literature or if you read a, you know, machine learning 101 textbook, and everybody always talks about ridge regression, which is I'm penalizing the sum of the squared weights. And on the previous slide that I showed you, that, that picture of the squiggle line, I was penalizing the sum of the squared weights. Uh, a bit of a, a note here is that what this tends to do is it tends to pull in correlates. So it will actually select co uh, highly correlated features in the data. The other thing that everybody talks about in machine learning textbooks and statistics textbooks is lasso. Right? So this is what I, what I was using earlier, which is it's now penalizing the sum of the absolute values of weights rather than the second one. And it has a property in that if there is ever a weight that lies between negative lambda and lambda, again, remember lambdas are around right here, then it's going to get snapped to be exactly zero. So it completely removes that variable from consideration. There's a group at Stanford that said, both of these has its own advantages and disadvantages. Why don't we combine them? And you might have heard the term elastic net. This is considered to be one of the most powerful ways to regularize a model right now, which combines both the ridge regression. What it does is it pulls up correlates in the data. And the lasso, which now removes variables that are not important, puts the two together. I'm able to capture the properties of both. But now I need two sliders, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Because remember, I, I still have this term. Right, so I have three terms. I have the error, I have my lasso term, and my ridge regression term. So I really need two sliders to make sure that I compensate for which is which. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the elastic net in this form. Yes. So I, I didn't really understand the lasso one. You said when you, why is it that when you're between lambda and minus lambda, it snaps it to zero? How is that? Uh, it has it has a property. Uh, so this property appears when you take the derivative of the, this function, and it has this absolute value in it, that property will fall out. It, it becomes a soft threshold function that says, if my solution is ever in this range, it's going to it has to be snapped to zero for it to be uh, for it to be a, an optimal. It's a it's a mathematical property, and if you're interested, I can point you to a paper that explains it in a lot better detail than I could. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the ridge regression penalty as quadratic norm. So again, this is an identity matrix, so this is exactly the sum of the, the squared values. Right? So this is just simple linear algebra. Again, I'm just going to reiterate something. So, so you can think of, again, the lasso penalty as there's a region that's defined to be between negative lambda 1 and lambda 1. And what it does is it snaps a feature. If a feature ever lands outside of it, it's going to get snapped to be exactly 0. And uh, not, not outside, sorry. 
I think I'm getting backwards. If it's ever inside this range, it's going to be snapped to be exactly zero. If it's out of the range, then it's okay. It's going to stay non-zero. And you can think of it, of this term, as it's a pairwise penalty on the weights. So right now, nothing off diagonal, right? So all we're doing is we're penalizing the weight with itself. So what we can do, and, and this, is, this is now the, pr the prior information coming in, is we can generalize this. We can, rather than having a single penalty for all of our weights, we can introduce individual weights. What this does is it has a property where if I have prior knowledge that tells me some of the features are more important than others, then I want to put a lower penalty on them. I want to encourage the model to select them. In the extreme case, I can set this penalty to be zero. And what that means is I never penalize that feature. That means it's always going to have a non-zero weight in the model. If I work in the biological applications and say I'm trying to predict patient survival, say they got some deadly form of breast cancer, I want to know how much longer they have to live, typically age is a very good predictor by itself. Even before you look at any genomic data, just looking at the person's age, you can make a very good predictor. So I want to make sure that age is included in my model, which means I'm not going to penalize age. I'm just going to set dj to be zero for that, for that feature. And that means it's always going to be selected in the model. And of course, you know, it's, it shouldn't be very surprising, but there's a matrix now here, and what it does is it captures pairwise penalties. And this is where you can introduce information about how you think features interact with each other. If you have, uh, actually, let me just go to the next graph, or the next picture. So one way to do this is with this graph Laplacian, right? So say that I have, you know, then. Uh, let me jump applications here. Suppose that I'm talking about computer vision right now, machine, machine, vision, machine vision. Every node here is a pixel, and the graph here tells me that these two pixels are somehow connected. Maybe they're in close proximity in an image. And this guy is off in a completely different corner of the image. So I have some prior belief that these two guys are connected, so they should ideally be selected and deselected together and be given a common weight. And I want to incorporate that into my model. Right, so what I can do is I can take the Laplacian of this graph, and this gives me a matrix. And now what I'm doing is I'm representing the negative values in the Laplacian with green boxes. A negative penalty is a positive reward. So what I'm doing is I'm basically rewarding the model for selecting 1 and 4 together. I am rewarding it for selecting 3 and 4 together. And I'm not introducing any penalty or, or anything else for, for any of the other pairs. Does, that, does this make sense? So what I've done is I've taken a graph that represents feature feature relationships, and I've encoded it as a penalty slash reward matrix, so that I am now able to select correlates according to this graph. Half of you are nodding, the other half of you are staring at me. So yeah, that's really cool. Right, so ho hopefully this kind of makes sense. Right. So we can experiment. I'm probably gonna briefly go over the results of how well it works. So I, we start out again with synthetic data. What I've done is I generate a random adjacency matrix A. I am now simulating a property that, that my true weights are going to be a random walk on this graph. So I've selected a subset of, of features on this graph, and that's going to be my true weights. I generate some random data from, from a normal distribution, mean zero covariance S. My response is simply W transpose X. In this particular case, I simulated the scenario where I have few samples, many dimensions. So this is about 50 samples, 5,000 dimensions. And then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm training to, I'm training elastic net, and I'm training my generalized elastic nets. And I'm giving my method, the Laplacian array, so I'm, I'm telling it what the, true, what the true graph was. And I also want to give it a, a random Laplacian and see, can you be confused by it, right? So if we do that, uh, what I've done here is I've measured how well I can reconstruct the true weight vector W. I've measured how well it can just produce RMSC. So this is root mean squared error. This is that, that squared error term before. And then what I'm terming as dispersion, which is this the solution that you've got, how dispersed is it on the graph that I, that I gave you? And not surprisingly, if, so, so the top row is it, it was given the true matrix. The bottom row is it was given the fake matrix, some, some other matrix. Not surprisingly, when you give it the true matrix, uh, so, so the x-axis here is how well the, the gel nets methods perform, the y-axis is the traditional elastic net, 
lower numbers is better when it's when it knows the true matrix, it's able to reconstruct the, the values better. Not surprising. What's interesting is that even though it's able to reconstruct better true weights, the actual model, the predictive power of the model, is not really any different. And the reason for that is that, uh, remember how I said elastic nets are really powerful? That is indeed so, that even if they don't know about feature-feature relationships, they're still able to produce an accurate model, a very accurate model. However, if we look at whether or not this, this model is consistent on the graph, we're going to see that it's not. Basically, when we give it the true graph, then uh, the solution that we get back is more consistent, more tight to path on our graph which is exactly how it should be. So this, this is the whole point of this method. So what I'm going to say here is don't treat this method as, you know, it's not, it's not, I'm not proposing method A is always better than method B. It's more, can we uncover a model that is just as accurate but is more consistent with respect to a particular graph? That's, that's all I'm going to say. Now. I'm going to skip this example. I'm just going to say that we've also applied this to uh, predicting sensitivity to drugs in breast cancer cell lines. There were several, 74 different compounds, and it's actually only, I don't remember the exact number, only 20 some compounds is where we actually got improved performance. So it's not always that you get better, better performance, as, as I mentioned earlier. But we can now look at them. I'm just gonna show you this one example here. So we can look at which, what, what is the model that got selected. So this is a gene network. Every hop here is a gene. It has an edge between them if they interact. And what was interesting about this particular drug is it inhibits one of the cell surface receptors. So think all the way back to the very beginning of the talk. Remember that protein that was sitting and sensing what's happening outside of the cell? Well, there are different types of them, right? So when we shut down one of them, what, it, what the signature told us is there were other proteins that were sitting on the surface that were picking up the growth signal from something else. So what this is saying is that you don't really want to use this drug alone you actually want to use it in combination with something else that shuts down another cell surface receptor. You can think of it as, as this way. If I'm kind of covering your ears, you're still able to see, so you're still able to get the signal. So if I really want to prevent you from getting the signal, I need to cover your ears, cover your nose, cover your eyes, and make sure that all of your senses are covered so that you're not going to grow. All right, so I'm going to stop here. I just want to acknowledge my lab members, um, especially mine. Uh, principal investigator Josh Stewart. Josh is uh, really fun to work with. He actually lets me do anything I want. Uh, I'm in my fourth year now as a postdoc, and if I ever have come up with a project, I could just grab a few grad students, form a team, and, and do things like, like winning the Dream Challenge. <coughs> We're also uh, very closely collaborating with David Hausler's lab. David's lab does a lot more analysis at the DNA level. A lot of a lot of what I talked about today was. RNA and a little bit of protein level. Then Ted Goldstein is actually an Apple X vice president, and he joined UCSC and he now has a, a faculty appointment there. So he kind of—it it was an interesting switch. He left the industry and he came to the to the academia. But he's always fun to talk to because he always gives me the perspective on things like that in the industry. And then Matter is runs a wet lab that helps a lot with our our. our sequencing and just getting the data itself. Now, something that's really exciting going on is that uh, we're, we're really focused on cancer, but our lab is now, the direction it's going is that we're going to start working on stem cell uh, data, doing a lot of the same stuff, so building predictors for things like, can you, can you separate, can you distinguish between differentiated and embryonic stem cells, for example. So if there are any senior grad students out here in the audience and you guys are looking for a postdoc, we are hiring um, one. So Josh, my, my PI, is actually looking for two postdocs. One is to replace me, and then to have another one. So, so if you're interested, talk to me. And this is where I'm going to stop. Thank you. We certainly know that these cells were not created in a flash, but rather by many generations of presumably simpler biological cell lines, do we have related information from them? Yes, there is actually some, so we don't do it in this lab, but there is 
uh, work in David's lab where they have a, 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 a clone, a kind of a, an entire population. So when, when you get a tumor, it's not just one cell, it's a, a collection of cells. And if you sequence each of those cells individually, you can look for mutations and you can see which of those are common. And this will give you kind of an evolutionary history of what happened. So the mutation that is most common to all, all of the cells is probably the one that arose at the very beginning. And then as cells start to replicating inside the tumor, they start picking up other mutations. And then the mutations that only happen in a small percentage of them are the ones that happened late. And uh, one, one other thing I want to mention here is that it's, it's actually, it's very uncommon for just a single mutation to break a cell and to cause it to become cancer. It's actually usually several mutations that happen along the way, and that's that usually because we have a lot of detect uh, a lot of kind of defense mechanisms that can detect when a cancer, you know, when something went wrong with a cell, and then this mechanism will tell the cell, okay, you now become senescent, you die, right? And it's only when not only did it pick up a dangerous mutation, but it also picked up another mutation that makes it prevent the rest of the organism from detecting it that becomes a problem. Yes? So a little bit related to the question, uh, can you call it the L1 uh, genetic mutation? Yep. Uh, how did that compare if you have one model, um, the same series of genes, how did that compare to different cell lines? Can you guys do that analysis? Uh, yes. Actually, this was interesting because in the post-challenge uh, analysis, We've tried that, is we try to drop all of the data from all the different cell lines into the same model. And that model ended up doing better, even though it was given exactly the same answer for all of the cells. What kind of cells? What kind of cell lines are uh, These were four breast cancer cells. Okay. And I, the explanation for that is because this data is, it, this, this goes back to this whole, like, there, there are very few samples and there are way too many dimensions. So by throwing additional data, even, even, even though it's slightly heterogeneous, we're able to get more samples and therefore more predictive power, even though we're sacrificing this heterogeneity. Sorry. The data that you got on the patients. So everything I talked about today is actually cancer cells that are grown in the lab. We have some other projects where we work with patient data, but I, yeah, I didn't cover it. And there it was about 40 or 50. So there's a data set that's pretty well known that has uh, 40 or 50 cells. Yeah, one thing I was struggling a little bit during that presentation with was um, complexity, how you're defining complexity. It looked like you were, you were sort of reweighting things based upon some measure of complexity. Did you did yep. have another go at explaining? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, this one. Right. So the complexity, the reason this becomes so wiggly is because the W weights grow out of, out of control. Right. If you were to look at the W weights here, each one is going to be in tens of thousands, even though we're on a scale between, you know, less than or, or between 0 and 1.2. So by penalizing the values of the weights, you're effectively penalizing the complexity of the model. <coughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good explanation. So, right. So, just the sheer value of the weight. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with the more with the Bayesian approach, maybe? Because yeah. 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 So, in the Bayesian case, you probably know about the Bayesian information criterion. So, typically, you introduce that as a penalty, and that that you know that penalizes the complexity. It tells you how. You know how many non non zero or I, I, I forgot it, but basically how complex your model is. Right. right. So BIC and AIC in the in the Bayesian world work exactly the same way. Cool. Yeah. In the very beginning of your talk you said that linear models were uh, good enough because you had a small number of samples, but you also showed one case where there were four points and kind of the diagonal two right, point. Right, right. And I was kind of wondering, how is that consistent with the idea that a linear model was good enough? If, if yeah, well, well um, what I said there, sorry, it's kind of like a little bit 
what I said here is that you can't do it in two dimensions, but as soon as you, you go up to one more dimension, in three dimensions, you'll be able to separate it with a line. So if you take these four points in three dimensions, you'll be able to separate them with a hyperplane. And the rule is, if you have n points, you need n minus one dimensions to be able to do that. Uh, general position. So, so could you explain in the case of three, how does a third dimension allow you to do that in this case? <laughs> well, you can think of them as these two points being behind the screen and these two points being over there. And now I'm just building a, or the screen itself will be a hyperplane. Why, how do you know that those two points are have those, you know, the same z and the other two? Other well, they don't necessarily have the same z, right? So, so this is why I say general position. That means that, that you don't assume that any two points have kind of, you assume that it's that the samples are uh, independent, identically distributed. Yeah, the general position means you, you, the z has to be there. If they're all in the same hyperplane, <coughs> that's not general position. And so, so one of the points has to stick out of the hyperplane of the other three points that, to be in general position. That's, that's a, right. It's right. a very strange. Yeah, if all of the points have the same z, then they don't actually live in three dimensions. They live in two dimensions. So you just happen to embed the two dimensions in three dimensions. It's a, it's a convoluted the definition. They didn't have the same z. I mean, well, I'll talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the way the geometry would work. It would work like that, for sure. All right. Yeah, you, you guys can come up and talk to me. Thanks again. Thank you.